I have received notice from the Minister of Finance that he wishes to make a statement on the budget. Before I call the Minister, I remind members that, in light of social distancing being observed by parties, I have, of course, relaxed the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question. Members do still have to make sure that their name is on a speaking list if they wish to be called, and I remind members to be concise in asking their question. This is not an opportunity for debate, and long introductions will not be allowed. Minister. I am today announcing the Executive's 2020-21 budget. Development of this budget began before the onset of COVID-19 and has been overshadowed by the unprecedented public crisis, health crisis that we face, a health crisis that impacts on every area of our lives. Protecting lives and livelihoods from the pandemic is now our number one priority. In that regard, Mr Speaker, many members in this chamber will want to know how this budget would help in our response to COVID-19. While we have been able to incorporate some COVID-19 measures within the budget, legislation prohibits us from including the majority of the COVID-19 funding that we have received. That legislation requires me to announce a budget at least 14 days after I have confirmed to the Assembly the level of funding available from the Secretary of State. I did this on 16 March. In normal circumstances, that would pose no difficulty, but we are not in normal circumstances. Since then, the world has changed dramatically. Only the initial £120 million of the fund provided for the COVID-19 response was included in my statement on 16 March. Therefore, this is the amount which can be included in the budget I am announcing today. We have subsequently received a further £792 million to help tackle COVID-19. Can Corla, some members may ask if the 14-day legislation has hindered our response to COVID-19. Let me categorically state that it has not. Whilst we cannot include funding in the formal budget announcement, it does not and will not mean that we will delay in any necessary intervention. Indeed, a number of announcements have been made and measures introduced in advance of this budget. Personal protection equipment has been ordered, car parking fees have been removed and public transport has been made free for key healthcare workers to help those leading the fight against COVID-19. Funding has been made available to ensure 97,000 children who are entitled to free school meals do not experience hardship as a result of schools closing. £370 million has been made available in grants to support some 30,000 businesses so they can continue to pay workers. Let me turn to the budget I am announcing today by firstly setting out my approach to rates. In terms of domestic properties, we have a relatively low rates and a strong protections for households on low incomes. To ensure no additional burden on the households during this difficult and uncertain time, I am freezing domestic rates. Whilst domestic rates are relatively low, business rates are extremely high. Our SMEs have long cited the cost of rates as a key difficulty. Indeed, this was strongly reflected in the business rates consultation. I can announce today the Executive is reducing the non-domestic regional rates. The regional rate has been adjusted downward to offset the change in the total rateable value due to Reval 2020. In addition, I have made a further 12.5 per cent cut. Today's reduction will effectively see an 18 per cent reduction on the 2019-20 figure, which will benefit all business ratepayers. Although I have decided to reduce business rates in advance of the COVID, I had decided to reduce business rates in advance of the COVID-19 threat. This reduction will help with the economic recovery needed on the other side of this pandemic. This regional rates reduction is being funded from the executive's existing resources. As previously announced, I am also providing a three-month business rate holiday to help all businesses raise pairs, a vast majority of which are SMEs, with the significant cash flow difficulties they face following the COVID-19 health crisis. This means business will see an additional 25 per cent discount to their annual rates bill. This will cost around £100 million and will be funded from the £120 million of COVID-19 funded included in this budget. In addition, I am re renewing the small business rate relief, providing almost £20 million of relief to 27,000 small businesses. Well, if the member would not mind, I have finished the statement, and I am sure he can ask a question on the other side of it. I am also restor restoring the rural ATM scheme, which helps sustain cash flow in some of the most isolated rural areas, something which is so important at the current time. And finally, I am delaying rates bills for households and businesses until the last possible moment, with the first bills to be issued in June. This will defer expenses as we wait the payments due in June under the Job Retention Scheme and the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme. The Executive will keep these measures under review and we will take further steps should we deem it necessary. 
There remains about £20 million of COVID-19 funding included in my statement on the 16th of March, which has not been included in this budget outcome. This will be added to the other COVID-19 funding and will be used as part of the Executive's response to the pandemic, which is separate from this budget. The budget announced today sets budgets at a departmental level, and Ministers will now look to allocating their budget across individual spending areas. Once those decisions are made, I intend to produce a budget document for members with that detail in advance of the debate and vote on the budget in May. Turning to the budget itself, the resources available to the Executive remain constrained. In real terms, our block grant remains some £360 million below pre-austerity levels when comparing like-for-like -like funding. Over that time, pressure on vital public services has increased. Public expectations were raised considerably by the New Decade New Approach document, but the British Government did not provide the funding necessary to deliver these priorities. However, I am able to deliver a budget that, compared to last year, provides real-term increases to all departments. In 2020-21, £12.2 of resource Dale will be allocated to departments, with a further £278.6 million to be allocated to the Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs for farm support payments, which replace the common EU Common Agriculture Policy payments. In addition, a further £70 million of centrally held funding will be allocated to departments during the year. On the capital side, the Executive intends to spend some £1.6 billion next year on a wide range of projects and programmes. More detail on these allocations is provided in the tables accompanying this statement. There is also some £195 million of financial transaction capital available to the Executive, which will be allocated once departmental proposals are at a more advanced stage. Going forward, the Executive intends to bring forward multi-year budgets, which provide greater certainty to public services and facilitate longer-term planning. In that process, we will engage in full consultation, which has not been possible for this budget. Cancorda, in difficult circumstances, this budget delivers additional funding for our citizens, for our workers and for our businesses. I commend this budget to the Assembly. Thank you. And I call Steve Egan, the Chairperson of the Finance Committee. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. And may I thank the Minister for earlier sight of his statement today and meeting with me as Chair of the Finance Committee earlier to discuss his statement. These, Mr Speaker, are indeed unprecedented times. And while we deal with this crisis, it would be appropriate for us to welcome the additional £912 million in funding. And I also take the opportunity to thank our national government for taking decisive action to help our workers, both those employed and self-employed, and to support our economy to allow, hopefully, a swift recovery from the current predicament. It is also important as we, as an Assembly, take time, even in this crisis, to continue to scrutinise the allocation of our budget. And despite some of the necessary measures we are taking, I can assure this House and from this Finance Committee and other committees, we will continue to the best of our abilities to make sure that the monies entrusted to us are appropriately spent. However, we have some, several specific questions. Firstly, on Mr. Minister, on budget allocations. Whilst noting that you have stated that the block grant is some £360 million below pre-austerity levels, largely departments are seeing an uplift in their budget allocations. The Executive Office alone will be seeing an increase of over 70 per cent. Perhaps the Minister could set out the reasons for such a significant increase. On rates, the Minister states that domestic rates are relatively low whereby business rates are extremely high. Does this indicate that the Minister, as part of a wider review of the rating system, is intending to keep the scale of domestic rates under review? We welcome the support being afforded to businesses, especially during these current circumstances. However, is the Minister considering the current COVID-19 mitigation measures beyond is the Minister considering the current COVID-19 mitigation measures beyond the current three months period? and extend it to the same length of time as the rest of the United Kingdom. On COVID-19, the Minister has indicated an additional £792 million, as well as the previous £120 million, is being made available as a result of COVID-19. It will be interesting to see how these funds are being distributed in order to ensure that the necessary resources are instantly available to respond to new or emerging pressures to those most in need. And again, related to this issue, you have indicated that the Executive has agreed to allow Ministers in year to set aside the current de minimis, de minimis rules and reporting any flex in their budgets of over a million pounds. 
Could the Minister please take an undertaking to write to the Committee Chairs, giving details of the decision of the Executive and on any guidelines on reviewing this decision as the pressures of COVID-19 hopefully recede? Mr Speaker, Mr Minister, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank the Chair for that. And, uh, I, uh, was happy to meet him this morning to give him uh, and the clerk of the committee a briefing in, in relation to the, the budget. He raises a number of issues which I, I, I'll try and address. The, the additional spend that he, he outlines in relation to the executive office is primarily due to the inclusion of $37.5 million for historical institutional abuse payments in 2020-21. Uh, and I will now look to the institutions involved to meet their obligations in respect to contributing to the cost redress scheme. Uh, the issue of domestic rates, as he has uh, highlighted, have been frozen. Uh, of course, we consider the, the, the broad rating policy, and, and we intend to look at it uh, as part of the multi-annual budget process that we expect to occur beyond this year. Uh, but we have no plans in relation to that at the moment. But we are in, in freezing the domestic rates. We are recognising, although relatively speaking, our domestic rates are low. People are very challenged, not just in business terms, but in meeting household payments. Uh, and so not only have we frozen the rate below the level of inflation, but we have deferred the collecting of those rates until June to try and assist households as well. Uh, and I, I have asked uh, in discussions with Treasury uh, that they do the same in relation to other bills, and particularly utility bills, that people are not pressed at uh, this time when, when are, a lot of people aren't able to work or are suffering a reduction in income. Uh, in relation to the, the rates, uh, relief that was part of the COVID package, uh, some of it involving the money in this budget, some of it uh, uh, will be beyond that. Of course, what we wanted to do was to get out uh, a significant package to, to take us over the first three months of this. That applied to all businesses, unlike the British uh, scheme, which applied to certain sections uh, of business. Uh, the, the, the scheme here applied to all businesses. And of course, we are anticipating further interventions as this rolls on, depending on the length uh, of time it takes to deal with this pandemic. Uh, and if we get uh, further interventions in that regard, I think we'd be able to perhaps consider tailoring uh, a scheme so that we, we focus more on the businesses which have suffered mostly as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and others perhaps have been able to continue on largely uh, as they have been before, perhaps in some cases even more, depending on what they happen to be manufacturing or uh, the food uh, sectors uh, perhaps are, are, are continuing on as, as before. Uh, the distribution of, of COVID funding, of course, we have, uh, as I, I said, we have allocated some 639 uh, million of that out of the 912. We have asked departments for uh, bids in relation to COVID specific. Uh, responses that they will bring to this, and we look forward to getting that. And of course, uh, should it be through statements to the Assembly, depending on, on how the EU uh, ad hoc committee works, or written statements, that uh, we will ensure that members get sight of that so they are able to scrutinise and to ask questions in the appropriate uh, manner. Uh, and in this final point in relation to flexibility, you know, as I had said to him earlier this morning, this budget was designed and drafted only a short number of weeks ago without any foresight of what we were really facing into. So what we have tried to add into that is a degree of flexibility for departments to, even though they have allocations against spending that they have asked for as part of the process it built up over a number of months, it's quite clear that some departments will not be able to spend money that they have uh, because certain functions aren't happening and they will not spend money uh, as they had planned. So we have allowed for a degree of flexibility, which we agreed at executive level, uh, and I can certainly write to him and to the other committee chairs uh, to outline that process where departments don't have the same requirement in terms of the level of spending and the, the I suppose, the approvals required to, to, so that we can be flexible uh, and agile in terms of our response across all departments to perhaps unforeseen challenges that may come our way in the next number of months. Uh, the executive will review that as time goes on, and if we consider that we've moved beyond the pandemic response phase, then we can stop that process and bring it back to the normal process of, of, of cap levels of uh, accountability mechanisms uh, and bring those back in play again. But we wanted to ensure that all departments had the flexibility to react quickly uh, to the crisis that we find ourselves in, and that's why we included, with executive agreement, this flexibility for the, certainly the period that the pandemic lasts. I call Paul through. And I welcome the Minister's statement today on the further funding that we have received from the Government. Uh, and I also welcome the Minister's statement on the 18 per cent reduction uh, in rates uh, for, uh, on the 1920 figure. 
Uh, but Minister, could I appeal to you that whilst you have given this reduction, if businesses are not in a position to pay their rates or don't exist, that rate base will not exist. Um, so I would ask the Minister to consider gravely uh, extending his three months holiday for uh, industrial rates uh, and match other devolved regions uh, of the UK in, in that. Can I also say that we welcome the small business uh, rate relief uh, grant, £10,000, and I know that some of those businesses are starting to receive that support uh, as we speak. But there, as inevitably will be the case, there will be people who fall through cracks, new start-up businesses that are on our high streets, but also small businesses who maybe fall below the, 10, the 15K for NAV um, and who maybe were getting the uh, industrial derating. Uh, small artists, small shops that uh, manufacture frames and sell prints, uh, those type artisans, those type of people who will not be able to avail of the 10,000 but still have massive cash flow problems and bills to pay. Uh, there may well be 2,500 of those businesses in, in Northern Ireland, uh, and it may well cost in the region of 25 million. But I would, I would ask the Minister to consider a mop-up exercise that those people could maybe be supported in the future, and also further mitigations and recovery measures that will aid businesses to crank up on the other side of this horrendous crisis. I would ask that the Minister takes those on, on board. But I can also add now, Minister, that I am deeply worried when I hear reports of intimidation uh, by Republicans and party activists of his party on businesses, employers and CEOs of manufacturing plants who are striving to stay open, who this Assembly may well call upon to redirect resources and make things for us that will save lives. And I'm deeply worried that I've heard reports of party activists from his party intimidating and harassing businesses to close completely. Can the Minister please uh, uh, address this House on that issue? Minister. Well, can I say in relation to the last uh, point, it's, it's a matter of regret that you bring accusations without any substance uh, to these. Of course, if you are aware of accusations which, of which are essentially criminal behaviour, you have an obligation to report those to the police, and I hope you have, rather than simply bring them here for publicity purposes. Uh, can I also say that in relation to rates holiday, the scheme devised in England and Wales is, is different from the scheme here in that it applies to certain sectors of business only. It does not apply to all businesses. The scheme we have introduced, and that scheme to replicate that in full here, is way beyond uh, our means, given the nature of our uh, business makeup here and the nature of our rates as well, is well beyond the executive means. But we took a decision to apply a three-month break for all businesses. Uh, and I think, should we get further interventions or other money available to us, we can consider further schemes in relation to that, uh, and, and perhaps more tailored schemes, certainly in relation to those businesses which are particularly suffering as a consequence uh, of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. The 10K grants, uh, I appreciate that all of these interventions, including the employee, employee retention scheme, including the self-employment scheme, the 10K grants and the 25K grants, will not cover every single person. Uh, uh, someone, as I said this morning, someone in manufacturing told me, get to 80 per cent quickly, and then you can try and mop up the rest. And what we nearly, clearly need to do, there are micro-businesses, there are other people who operate from their homes, and they don't have uh, that ability to access the small business rate relief scheme. Uh, and clearly, we're hearing from all of those who have not fallen uh, into these schemes. Uh, and so I, I think it is a uh, responsibility both of ourselves uh, but also the Department for the Economy, who are managing the, the, the business grant scheme, uh, using the rate space uh, then to see if there are further schemes that they can identify and cost, uh, which, uh, which will try and, and catch those businesses that have fallen through the cracks in relation to some of the interventions to date. Uh, and of course, uh, he does mention recovery measures, identifying how to support uh, the economy coming out of this pandemic. That is clearly a matter for the Department of the Economy to identify, and I hope that they are uh, doing work in that regard. Uh, of course, we are facing it an awful lot of unknowns uh, and, and perhaps unforeseen consequences, uh, but certainly in the time ahead, uh, I think there will be a need for recovery uh, measures, uh, and clearly in terms of support for business, uh, that will be uh, measures which I think will be identified and brought forward by the Department of the Economy. 
I call Gemma Dolan. Um, I want to thank the Minister for his statement and I really want to commend him and his officials for the bold yet necessary steps that have been taken over the past few weeks. Can the Minister outline the flexibilities that have been given to departments to allow them to deal with the immediate impact of the coronavirus? Thank you. Minister. Yes, I uh, thank the member for the question. As I said in, in response to the, the, the committee chair, the uh, this budget was, I suppose, devised and planned over a period of months uh, when we, we had no idea of what we were facing into currently in relation to the pandemic. Uh, and as it was being finalised, the full realisation of perhaps uh, the, the unprecedented, unique circumstances that we now find ourselves in uh, were becoming more apparent. Uh, so as well as you know, specific funding requests and pressures identified over many months by departments weren't necessarily in relation to the current crisis that we face ourselves uh, that we find ourselves in uh, and so what we we tried to do then as well as obviously allocating the specific coronavirus money that has been uh, come across from treasury to us to departments to meet that challenge we also uh, try to allow departments some flexibility in terms of the normal constraints they have uh, of, of caps and amount of money they can shift within departments and also the uh, accountability measures the executive agreed that we needed to allow some flexibility for a period of time until the executive deemed that is no longer necessary. Uh, and so uh, we have allowed people to be agile. And I think that's what the public would expect of us, to be as agile as we possibly can, to be on our toes, uh, to be recognising that what we had previously planned for no longer counts. Uh, although services have to continue and spending has to continue in departments, but there are much greater challenges that immediately face us that we have to have the agility and the resource, even within the limited and constrained resources we have, to try and meet as best we possibly can. So we have allowed that, and what I will do, as I had uh, undertaken to the, the chair of the Finance Committee, is to write to the committee chair so they have a clear understanding when they're scrutinising the spending by the various departments that they, 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 they hold to account, that they're recognising the arrangements that there are. But can I make clear the executive will, if it deems in the time ahead, over the course of this year, deems that that uh, situation is no longer required, then we will bring back the arrangements that we normally have for the moving around of money within departments. I call Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for coming um, to the Assembly today to give us this update. Um, Every time he comes to the House, we seem to be saying it's extraordinary times. It really is extraordinary times now, and we are completely focused on dealing with this public health emergency before us. I just have a few um, specific questions, but before that, I think it's worth saying that it's very important that this Assembly, later in the year, when we hope we are through the worst of this and we hope we've minimised loss of life, that we get to scrutinise properly the budgetary process, as we keep saying we want to, but accepting that these are extraordinary times. So can the Minister um, just update on a few things? One is he talked about reprioritisation of certain spending um, towards um, from certain departmental budgets towards coronavirus, and he talked about flexibility for budgets. You know, can you just give a little bit more detail? Does that mean that thresholds in terms of underspend will be raised, or that budgets will be pushed forward to the next year, and which specific departments is he talking about? Um, one point he's been um, talking about, he was on the radio this morning, is about the PPE that we've hopefully procured on an all-Ireland basis. Can you give a bit more detail on, is it CPD within the Department of Finance who have procured that? Exactly how much have they procured? When will it be here in the north? What are we getting? And, you know, in a sense, who's responsible for dispersing it throughout the trusts? And then my last question is really about... Um, thinking about what we, what we all know, which is that health workers are doing an extraordinary job, making extraordinary sacrifices on our behalf and the behalf of our loved ones. Is he, is, he, is he giving thought, and will he give thought with the Department of Health, to how that can be recognised in terms of a pay award going forward? Because I think we all realise, we're all realising what's actually important, what's actually valuable in our society and in our labour force. Minister. I thank the member for, for his, uh, his contribution and, uh, of course, he, he rightly recognises the circumstances that we're in and, and in, in many ways the, the rule book doesn't apply on a whole range of measures. Uh, can I say that we, we are, uh, and we, we, we agreed this with the, the Chair of the Finance Committee when we met this morning, that the, the intent, recognising that most of the people in the departments who do this work are all working remotely uh, and, and that usually when we bring the budget in May, to the Assembly is based on a printed document, and that might be difficult to do this time, but the intent is to try and get people in the departments to provide detail of the spending plans uh, as, as, as best they can, uh, uh, and that we collate a document, uh, whether 
uh, intention is to try and have that published, but whether it perhaps has to be delivered electronically to members so they can study it uh, if we aren't able to do that. And we do that in advance of the 4th of May, so people will have the ability to properly scrutinise this budget uh, and what has been spent. And hopefully, uh, in the time ahead, we, we, we do get into that process of multi-annual budgets and much more uh, proper scrutiny, because we, even without these circumstances we find ourselves in today, we didn't have the sufficient level of scrutiny in advance of this budget because there wasn't an Assembly sitting. Uh, and so uh, with hope, we hope that in the autumn we get back to a much more normal uh, scrutiny process for the entire budget going forward. Uh, in terms of reprioritising and that flexibility, what we have said to departments, if because we at, at the moment we are trying to identify what is required in relation to response to COVID-19, we have obviously identified business support. We have identified uh, the necessary health support as well. Uh, that, that may change and develop as time goes on. And as, as others have outlined, the business support measures have have. Uh, captured quite a lot of people but left out some people as well and we need to be flexible about how we approach that. But that does, as I say, reduce the cap uh, in, in terms of how people could shift money about within departments. It also reduces the, the, the accountability mechanisms. That doesn't mean that there's no accountability for this. The, the Department of Finance will want to know how people are spending their money, uh, but all of those approvals that would have been perhaps held up and slowed up the process in the short time ahead will be set aside so that departments can be flexible. That applies to all departments, and it will apply to uh, the response to this. It's not about simply uh, meeting other pressures and priorities that they already had. This is, is specifically to allow people flexibility to deal with the circumstances we find ourselves in. In terms of PPE procurement, I mean, he will know that the Department of Health is responsible for its own procurement. Uh, and what, what we had undertaken to do initially uh, was because there was a significant demand from other services, blue light services, you know, police, ambulance, fire brigade, forensic scientists. Uh, we had undertaken to procure PPE for all outside the Department of Health. As of from last week, we, we, we have now a joint approach in terms of PPE procurement. Uh, the, the one which is identified in, in the joint order with the, the government in Dublin. Uh, what we are ensuring is that the appropriate people are on the ground to make sure that that order is secured, that it is the right uh, equipment that we need, that it meets the specifications that are required, because there's no point in importing this if we find out it is not what we need or it's not what we ordered. Uh, and so before we get into detail of exactly the quantities, which are significant, uh, that we want to ensure that we have the right order uh, secured and on its way home. Uh, and then we will be able to release that. But I am glad that we are in a position now where we are working on relation to the Department of Health's procurement in relation to PPE, because I think that gives us a stronger position. I have also asked the Department, our procurement team, who I have to, I have to take this opportunity to, to pay a tribute to, because they, they are in the Department every day working uh, very, very strongly in relation to this. I know other civil servants are working remotely from home and, 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 and are applying themselves very diligently as well. But they are being uh, really flat out over the last number of weeks, reaching out not only to other supply chains, because we always have the concern that our existing supply chains will go down uh, as a result of unforeseen consequences. The realisation perhaps in America and in India that they're facing a big crisis could actually, uh, you know, if you like, corner all of the available PPE supplies. So we've also been reaching out to local manufacturing to make sure that we try and establish some supply chains on the island itself. Uh, that if in the event that international supply chains go down, that we, we have some cover there as well. Uh, and in relation to the pay award, of course, he, he, he knows that one of the first actions of the new executive was to make the pay award to nurses. Uh, and of course, I agree with him in his recognition of the, the sterling work that frontline health services are doing and a, a range of services, public services are doing in response to this. Uh, and, and ironically, it is those who were worst paid and had the worst conditions that now have come to the forefront in terms of fighting uh, on behalf of the entire society to keep all of us safe. So I, I think I would hope that as society changes and re-examines its priorities across all societies in the time ahead that we recognise those who we rely on most. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I would echo the words and um, thanking the officials for the work that has been done. Um, Late at night, weekends and everything else, you're getting replies to emails. You have officials working night and day in relation to not only this budget but many other things, and I would like to thank them for that. Um, as the Minister has outlined, this, we're living in a very rapidly evolving situation. The challenges to our public finances were immense before COVID-19 arrived, and now we're in a situation of not only facing a public health emergency but an economic um, crisis. 
Um, and as has been outlined, this is somewhat of a, an interim budget uh, that we're facing. And I do welcome the approach that's been taken by the Minister of that agile approach. I think it's important that all funding is provided as much as we can to the health service. But my question really relates to the recovery and how we can ensure that we're providing sufficient funds to ensure that this economy recovers. Uh, it's very likely we're going to be entering into a recession, if not a depression. There's reports today of one in six people could be out of their jobs. And there's particular sectors that have been badly affected as a result of the current crisis. Um, we know what they are. They're hospitality, hotels, leisure, non-food retail. There's a list. Um, and they really do need that assistance to be able to recover. It also has been echoed in relation to businesses who don't uh, pay rates. Those businesses that are um, micro-businesses that have been developing but are not able to avail of any support, and it's whether the Minister will consider any further measures to assist those net sectors which are very badly affected as a result of this current crisis, um, or those that are not actually able to avail of any grants whatsoever, and whether we can consider using the borrowing powers to assist those, because if we don't start planning for the recovery now, the economic damage as a result of this crisis will be very much more severe. Thank you. Minister. Uh, yes, I, I mean I, I recognise entirely that the, you know, turning our minds towards recovery is absolutely essential, and I will, as I said to previous speakers, uh, rely on the Department for Economy to, to identify what they think is, is vital going forward. Our first priority was to try and keep people afloat, to try and keep wages paid, to keep doors open, to keep lights on and roofs over people's heads, uh, and so the, the, the intervention in terms of rates. Uh, the intervention in terms of business support grants, the, both the 10,000 one and the 25,000 one, were key to get those out the door as quickly as we could to try and uh, keep people in business because we will require those people to come back into business on the other side of this. And of course, the intervention package, packages from the uh, Treasury in terms of employee retention uh, were key, uh, particularly in relation to the hospitality industry, who didn't want to make people redundant. And, and if they had to, be, had to do that, then they the pressure on our social security system would have perhaps overwhelmed it. And the self-employed scheme, while all of those schemes have, have certain uh, flaws in them, or, or, or aren't, but I think we have to bear in mind with those schemes that even with the schemes we're doing, we are now doing things in the space of days that we would have previously taken months to do consultation, planning, engagement, you know, testing uh, various things. And we're, we're now having to do work which would previously have taken six months for schemes like these, or perhaps even more, to get out the door and turn around days, to intervene as quickly as we can. So, uh, and uh, in relation to some of them, uh, we have had conversations with the Controller and Auditor General to say, we are doing things that normally you would be coming after that, and I think he understands as well uh, the need to respond very quickly to these measures. So, uh, I, I would say that, of course, we need to look uh, beyond this then as, as we hopefully start to see light at the end of the tunnel to recovery uh, and what that looks like and what needs support. Uh, I would just make a general point uh, for all of us and for, for anyone who ha happens to be listening. I mean, we should, if we, we haven't considered before, uh, really support our local businesses. We should really, after this is over, look to those businesses, particularly I know in, in my own circumstances, the village where I live, the visit to businesses who have behaved so responsibly uh, as part of a community network of supporting local people, of delivering grocery services to them, of you know, acting responsibly in terms of how they open their doors and how they do business, of closing ahead of being required to close in, in relation to many of the hospitality sector before they were actually told to close. Businesses who we know uh, and perhaps have taken for granted for many years, local businesses, that if, if we have money to spend on the other side of this, we really, as individuals as well as, as a, a, a government, should be looking to support local businesses and ensure that those who supported us during this crisis then, in turn, uh, enjoy the benefit of our spend on the other side of it. I call Jonathan Bugley. Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for his statement in, in relation to the additional funding allocated, and in particular the $639 million for COVID-related activity within the departments. That's most welcome. It's indeed good to say that in a time of crisis, we have prioritised uh, these issues as a matter of concern, and I think that will be a very welcome signal to many of our constituents across Northern Ireland. I welcome the um, um, particular schemes not only put on in place by this assembly in relation to the freezing of rates, etc., but also from the British government, which will help alleviate some of those immediate concerns facing many of the businesses today. But I just want to echo the point put forward by my colleague, Mr. Free, in relation to looking at particular measures to extend that in industrial rate freeze uh, for the industries particularly affected 
uh, throughout COVID-19. I think that would be a very welcome step. Uh, and I also want to press upon you maybe to, to press further in relation to the uh, self-employed, because while, I, while they welcome the fact of this new uh, funding package which they can access, but the delay in getting that to them could effectively mean a lot of these uh, self-employed people can't even put bread on the table, and I know the Minister will, will take that point up at the executive table. Um, you have mentioned in particular, and this is a point on which I would like you to address, it was related to by Mr O'Toole, in relation to the creative way in which PPE has been secured by the Department. Have you any indication of how quick that will essentially get out on the ground to these organisations outside of the health service, which are in much in need of this PPE at this time? Thanks. Minister. Uh, well, can I say in relation to further rates measures, uh, as I have said before, uh, we have tried to use quickly the, 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 the uh, the business support packages that were available to us, get them out quickly. The, the LPS, the rate space, is a very quick and accurate way of getting money to businesses. We know who the businesses are, we know what they're paying, we know that they've been paying recently, they're viable businesses they still exist because they're paying rates. So it's, it's, it's a very accurate tool for getting that. It also obviously leaves some gaps in relation to, uh, and the quickest, I suppose, way to do that and get support out of the ground quickly was to try and cover all businesses. Uh, and that's not the same as the, as the scheme in England and Wales, which targets certain sectors. Uh, so if there are further uh, initiatives to be taken in relation to that, I, I think as time goes on, we get a clearer understanding than we had perhaps even two weeks ago when this measure was done. We get a clearer understanding of the impact in certain sectors and perhaps a lack of impact on certain mm -hmm. sectors then. We'll see if it is possible, and it's a challenging exercise to try and differentiate businesses, but we'll see if it's possible to get a more tailored uh, support scheme in relation to that. The self-employed scheme has come from the Treasury. It only came uh, announcement last week. It was obviously following the employee retention scheme. There was a very significant focus that the self-employed had been left out. This scheme has come in. I, I spoke to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury last Friday in relation to it. Uh, again, as with the, the employee retention scheme, it's the, the delay in introducing it is placing people in a real crisis in the intervening weeks. Uh, and particularly self-employed, whatever about larger industries' ability to absorb that delay, uh, many people who are self-employed aren't obviously in the same uh, level of income uh, and their businesses aren't in the same level of turnover to try and absorb that uh, delay. So I have raised specifically the, the delay to June to paying self-employed and to, to argue that that comes quicker because quite a, a number of our people may be put out of business in the intervening period and I think that needs to, uh, needs to happen. In relation to PPE, uh, yes, as I said in the answer to Mr O'Toole, that we we had previously responsibility for trying to secure that for all of the other services. We are now working with health to try and secure supplies for them as well. We are talking to local business in terms of what they can do. We are also talking to local businesses who are not functioning and have PPE supply, PPE supply themselves for what they previously were doing to try and, and get some of that. Now, that there, there are different standards of it. There are, are different specifications required for different, uh, uh, different services. Uh, so we're not sure uh, where we could fit that, uh, but we have put out a general call uh, to businesses and indeed you know, some of the universities and others hold stocks of PPE to try and have those released into the centre so we can distribute those, uh, hopefully perhaps to people like domiciliary care workers who uh, seem to have been left uh, particularly short, but uh, certainly the PPE that's required for our health professionals who are at the front line of this needs to be very specific to their needs, uh, and we need to ensure that that is properly procured and it meets the requirement. And we need to ensure that there's a confidence among those who are going out at the front line to fight this pandemic, that the, the resources they need, the tools that they need to fight this are available to them, that, that the executives focus on, on supplying them with all of the tools necessary to do the job, and they are confident that we have their back in that regard. Before I call the next speaker, could I urge members to curtail their number of questions because so far we are well over half the time available to us in this session and we have had six members been able to ask questions. But because of the multiplicity of many of those questions, we now have 11 speakers in the queue. There is no question of getting those 11 members. So could I ask the further members, when they are now asking their questions, to keep them to a minimum and reduce their commentary around the issue as well? I call Zaglan Magalier. Um, in light of the COVID-19 crisis, the closure of many food outlets uh, and indeed the livestock marts, can the Minister advise if 
Farmers, the vast majority of whom are self-employed, if they can avail of the recently announced self-employed income support scheme, the job extension scheme, and the other recently announced schemes which have been put in place to support employees and employers during this current crisis? Well, the, the way these schemes are working is that the PHMRC are going to contact those people who they, they deem to be eligible uh, to, to do that. So if they deem uh, farmers to be eligible to do that, then they may do. Of course, uh, it's, it's people who they would imagine whose business has been very adversely affected as a result of the crisis. If people are in the food production or on that, uh, that broad range of food production, it, it might be considered that that hasn't adversely impacted them. I, I don't doubt that farmers, like everyone else, are struggling in the current circumstances. So I, I think that if they, if they are, are entitled to the scheme, they will hear directly from those who are organising the scheme. I call Paul Given. Can I welcome the 6.3 per cent uplift in the Department for Justice's uh, baseline? It's something that the committee supported the Minister's call for, and we look forward to scrutinising uh, how that is now going to be uh, delivered. In, in respect of the PPE, I, I welcome the initiative um, that had been taken by the Minister uh, to procure on behalf of all of the de departments, with the exception of health at the initial stage, uh, and now that they are on board, uh, I welcome that. Uh, but he is right when he says there is a need for confidence for people uh, to feel that they can do the job, and that exists right across the public sector, uh, private sector, and indeed in health, where people are still being asked to carry out important roles but don't have the confidence uh, to do that in a way that protects them and their families. So, what PPE has been delivered as a result of the procurement exercise that he has initiated, and when will that be uh, delivered uh, here to those people in Northern Ireland? And I echo the remarks that we need a more flexible scheme for the cash grants because it is missing a significant number of businesses? Well, can I say, as he says, part of this is to give confidence. Uh, and I, I recognise that even in, the, uh, even in the, the, the documentation we've received, the Health Department recognises it is about morale as, much, uh, as well as protection. And, and, and one of the key lessons from the Italian experience was that if people didn't have appropriate PPE in the hospital setting where they were dealing, they actually became transmitters of the disease and the outcome was much worse. So we have to learn the lessons from international experience. We have to make sure that our health professionals are properly equipped uh, to protect themselves, uh, because they are the frontline workers in relation to all this, but also that they don't become transmitters of this uh, disease themselves. So, uh, and in terms of getting confidence, what I want to do in, in terms of the major order we placed with the uh, with, uh, alongside the Dublin government for, for health is to make sure that we have all that we have asked for, that is the standard we require and that it is on its way back. Uh, so rather than announce something and find that there is some interruption to that, we, uh, I mean, there is such a huge demand going into China at the moment uh, from all nations uh, in relation to this that uh, we want to be certain. And we, there are people from Invest NI and the IDA on the ground to do that work for us in China, and we are obviously using embassies as well. Uh, to make sure that we have that. So we want to give confidence to people that we have this. We also have, have as I say, uh, begun that procurement exercise in relation to other services. Uh, I know the police uh, service in particular are satisfied that the, 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 the con initial concerns they have are now being met. Uh, and we want all public services who go out who need to be appropriately kitted out to meet their challenge in relation to this pandemic uh, to have the confidence that they have the material they need. Nicole Keeve Archibald. Um, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement and also for the work of him and his team in terms of responding to this crisis. Um, the, the schemes that have been introduced so far to support workers have been really welcome, and, but if there is a lack of clarity and some gaps in those. In particular, there's a lack of clarity around whether, non -essential business, whether all non-essential businesses will be able to avail of the, the job retention scheme. There are businesses who are very keen to close and allow their workers to stay at home for, the, for their health and peace of mind, but they're unsure if those workers will uh, if they will actually be able to pay those workers. And at the same time, then you have companies like EasyJet who are able to pay out hundreds of millions of pounds in dividends to their shareholders and avail of public funding to pay some of their employees. So it seems somewhat immoral then that companies on a tiny fraction of those profits are uncertain if their employees are going to be covered by this scheme. And I'm sure the minister would agree with me that workers are the backbone of our economy and their livelihoods need protected in all of this. So could you perhaps give us an update in terms of the discussions with Treasury in, time, in trying to get clarity around the eligibility for the job retention scheme? Gormaga. Minister. Yes, I, I think as, as with all these schemes, and I've, I've, I've acknowledged the fact that schemes have been devised and put out through the door within 
48 hours. So uh, uh, normally schemes, uh, particularly of this magnitude, would perhaps take years to consult on and devise and properly structure and look at all of the potential gaps and the uh, downsides to them. So we, we have to recognise that these things will be done quickly. The, the Treasury have come back with further clarification in relation to the job retention scheme because quite clearly there are people who are deemed uh, to be uh, non-essential uh, but were advised they could still continue to function. But if they couldn't properly uh, put in social distancing practices within their workplace, then they clearly could. They clearly contradict the health advice. So in some ways, the health advice from the British government contradicted the economic advice, uh, and it has left people uncertain. And we have pressed and pressed uh, to ensure that there was uh, that there is. Uh, as great a clarity as possible. Uh, the health advice is that you shouldn't be out uh, of home unless you absolutely have to. That, for me, defines as essential. Uh, and so we can't say that on the one hand and then say to other businesses, but you could say open if you like. Uh, so that has caused confusion, uh, and I accept that, as I say, these schemes are done in a, a very rapid fashion and undoubtedly don't cover every single uh, base that needs to be covered in, in, in the speed which, which has been devised and got through the door. And the, the, the support that they have provided to employers to retain workers is, has been absolutely vital, so I acknowledge that. Uh, can I say in relation to people who have taken avail of these schemes and not, not done perhaps the right thing, and I'm not being specific to any company, we did put out a, a, a statement a, a week or so ago in relation to procurement uh, from the Finance Department, which is responsibility for procurement, where we said uh, we will ask all departments to make sure there is prompt payment to people who are providing services. That we will ensure that we, we do not delay in, in getting money that is owed to firms, to firms. But in doing that, we expect those firms in turn to pay subcontractors. We expect them to pay employees. We do not expect them to put that prompt payment onto their profit margins and into their profit lines. Uh, and that if we find that firms that do that, with this money that we are getting out to try and support the community, then they will not be considered for future public sector contracts. That we will monitor how the prompt payments are actually spent by the firms who receive them. And I think similarly uh, for the government, the British government, if they are finding that whatever firm takes advantage of job retention schemes and, and, and behaves in a way which is unethical in the circumstances that we now find ourselves in, then those firms, I think, should feel uh, the weight of disapproval then on the other side uh, of, of the, this crisis. Call Mark Durgan. I will give the Kian Korya August Abuehas Lishan Tyra for Hanya and Fagri Kajisha. I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement and also the, the efforts of himself and his executive colleagues to get a safety net in place for those impacted economically uh, by the crisis now engulfing us. That safety net still does have holes. We've heard a bit about them today. I think we all have a responsibility to identify those holes with a view to getting them mended so that nobody falls through them. But it's just in terms of the financial impact and the resources going towards that safety net, can the Minister give an assurance that they won't impact on another safety net that we here in this Assembly have agreed as essential to protect our most vulnerable people, and that's in terms of welfare mitigations? Will this impact on our ability to strengthen and uh, ex sorry, extend and strengthen uh, the mitigation package going forward? Minister. Yeah, can I say I can assure him no that we have actually, as part of this, uh, as uh, as part of this budget itself, uh, 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 allocated additional resources to the Department for Communities to meet specifically the welfare mitigation challenges, uh, both in relation to the, the bedroom tax scheme uh, and ongoing support. I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm just trying to find the figure, but I, I can get the figure to him. But we have secure, uh, as, as part of this budget, uh, we have additional resources to the Department of Communities for welfare mitigation for the, uh, the bedroom tax scheme, for other mitigations, and also for welfare advice. So there is resources being dedicated to that. So we, we, we recognise, of course, when we're trying to protect businesses, we're trying to protect workers. Uh, and their, their incomes, and we're trying to protect families. We also have a, a very significant duty to protect the most vulnerable, who are perhaps most in need of our support at this time. Call Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, the uh, minister has already explained why the uh, resource dial for the executive office is, is up over 70 per cent from baseline, and that's uh, to advance a redress for the victims of institutional abuse, and I'm sure the whole House welcomes that. Uh, but on his theme of being agile, uh, can he inform the House whether there are other budget lines across all departments 
uh, such as the budget for establishing uh, the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression and the Associated Commissioners, which could be with agility reprofiled to help fund the fight against COVID-19. Well, uh, can I say the, the uh, departments have been tasked with bringing forward essential business uh, in relation to this. The executive or the assembly rather is, has also been tasked with dealing with essential business. So that means that, as I had said, in terms of the flexibility that we have provided departments, some of the business which departments quite rightly had planned for three weeks ago is now no longer perhaps deliverable in terms of, if, of what the assembly is able to process and legislate for. Uh, so departments, all departments will have to reconsider what their, their, their spending, uh, can, uh, what spending they can do in the, in the immediate time ahead in terms of how this assembly can function to support the delivery of that spend and how departments themselves can deliver that in terms of the personnel available to them or even the, the programmes or the areas of work they were targeting at. So that's a general approach across the executive uh, and of course what we have asked uh, departments to be as flexible as possible. Uh, and obviously we would we want if any programmes or, uh, uh, or projects are interrupted or delayed as a consequence, I, I don't doubt departments will want to pick those up very, very quickly on the other side of this pandemic. Before I call Sean Lynch, could I just remind people, could you try to focus on the limited number of questions that you should be asking? Thank you. My good uh, John Collier, could I ask the Minister if the one million allocated this year for people affected by the blood contamination scandal will continue next year? Yes, I, I was very pleased. Uh, one of the, the earliest acts when I took over as finance minister was to find in, a, in the January monitor around uh, a million pounds for the Department of Health. This it was a scandal that has been going on for far too long, uh, and uh, the Department of Health, uh, through ongoing discussion, have, have, have uh, satisfied the, uh, the request from the people uh, affected. And what we have in next year's budget is provided a further additional one million pound to meet that cost next year as well. I call Karen Mullen. Uh, I thank the Minister for his statement and for the work and uh, the work of his department so far. Minister, I welcome the increase you have made available to the Department of Education and in particular uh, confirmation from the Education and Communities Ministers that the parents of children entitled to free school meals will receive direct financial payment. Um, can I ask the Minister to provide some further detail in relation to the flexibility he has introduced around procurement, as if the Department of Education could follow in that, then along with increased funding, this would go a long way in making schools' core budgets sustainable? Well, can, can I say, uh, yes, as part of the COVID response, we obviously were very glad to, uh, to uh, allocate 18.9 million to try and support those to ensure that we, we don't experience uh, that, that kids who don't aren't, haven't, aren't able to access school and that, that free school meal uh, don't suffer as a consequence that we know that holiday hunger is a very real uh, uh, factor in, in, a, in the lives of an awful lot of children. Uh, can I say in relation to the flexibility, the, the flexibility is really to try and meet challenges that might arise as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have said to departments it's not simply about shifting funds about to meet other pressures. Uh, so uh, departments understand that we are in unprecedented times. They understand that we have reduced relaxations that would never otherwise apply. Uh, but they also understand that we are, we are doing this to meet a particular challenge, not the normal challenge of departments. And I appreciate that every department is challenged. While we've managed to give a, a, a real increase to every single department, that nonetheless does not meet all of the pressures that they all, all experience. Uh, so uh, it is, this isn't about shifting money about to try and meet existing pressures, but trying to meet the challenge that they have in terms of the, the crisis that we're, we're facing into. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the Minister for his indulgence today. Uh, can the Minister give any uh, update or information with regard to asking either ele electricity or gas providers to potentially freeze bills for a period of time up to six months? Well, I can say that I, as part of the conversations I've had with Treasury, uh, when we talked about what we could do in the rates, in, in terms of rates reduction and deferring rates bills, including domestic rates bills, uh, for a number of months uh, to try and, and see how households get over uh, the current crisis, that we've also raised the issue of utilities with him as well, uh, with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, uh, and asked that the British Government obviously have more authority to intervene in terms of some of those companies which would be uh, based over there as well, uh, more authority to intervene. So I do think there is 
uh, an onus on all, both public and private, and that's why I think it's important for public to take the lead in terms of prompt payments, ensuring down the chain is paid, ensuring uh, that there's an ethical approach uh, to the next uh, number of months and the times that we face. Uh, I, I, would, I would think that uh, if the public side takes the lead, that I would, uh, I would hope that the private side uh, also takes, uh, takes uh, some following from that uh, in terms of uh, understanding that households are very hard pressed. Everybody, almost everybody has their income reduced. Uh, people aren't able to get out uh, and there are real pressures building on households and that I think all companies need to recognise that in the time ahead. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement this morning. And I appreciate it's not the statement that you envisage to be making to this House, and that's very difficult. And it's difficult for us as members to give it, um, any type of, of statement or budget due scrutiny at, at this particular period of time. But what I would ask, um, and it's something similar to the Chair of the Economic Committee asked earlier on, it's about the communication between the finance uh, department and the economy department and, and how you get out the messages to businesses exactly um, what uh, the, the, the schemes have been put in place and what support mechanisms they are getting. There's a real confusion out there about um, who is uh, actually uh, cl uh, clarified that they're an essential business and who is not, uh, and uh, about social distancing within the workplace. And that is really, really hurting the economy. Uh, and in a way, it's demonising businesses unnecessarily at this particular time. And I know that um, whilst it's not part of, of your um, particular budget here and statement here today, but it's certainly part of the work for the Department of Finance. And I would like to see better communication um, to the business community, and it needs to start immediately. Um, there's been questions asked, and they're not been answered. Minister, well, can I say I accept uh, that? Uh, I accept that there has been confusion, but there have been a variety of packages done very quickly. Some come directly from London, and some we have devised ourselves. Uh, and what, in terms of the ones we've devised, we've tried to use the rate space as the most accurate tool to get out to business. And we recognised in doing that that there were certain businesses would. Uh, would not uh, come in under that umbrella, if you like. Uh, but on the, on the basis that we could get uh, money out quickly, we had to use the most readily available tool to us. And, and uh, of course, what we've been doing since is fielding the queries from all businesses. And I hope uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the department is trying to turn around that advice. I know other members have referred to the, the fact that the officials are getting back to them very promptly and, uh, with the raised advice. Some of the other schemes that have come from London, equally because, uh, as I outlined, these schemes, which would normally be the product of a lengthy consultation process, uh, have been turned around within 48 hours, perhaps, and, uh, and got out the door, uh, have, have similarly you know, prompted confusion among businesses as to who is available, who is uh, able to uh, apply for the job retention, uh, who is able to, to, to avail of the self-employed scheme. Uh, the issue in terms of uh, who should be open and who should be closed, I think, is one which is, continues to cause confusion because, on the one hand, uh, the Prime Minister in London uh, listed a whole series of essential businesses but then, and essential workers and then, in essence, said, but anybody can stay open if they want, basically. Uh, that contradicts the health advice, which is you should be closing down unless you absolutely have to be involved in work. Uh, the social distancing, I, I think, uh, I listened to the press conference yesterday that the First and Deputy First Minister did, and I thought there was a very clear message in relation to the requirements of anybody who is retaining employees in work at this time to be putting in adequate measures for social distancing and the formation of that forum, which is under the control of the Department of the Economy, uh, to involve uh, health and safety executive and others uh, in that labour relations agency to ensure that there is a, at least a forum for businesses to come and get advice and be told very clearly, plus a, a, an area of enforcement within that. So if workers are, are concerned that they are being forced into circumstances which are endangering them, that they also have uh, a channel where they can raise issues as well and make sure uh, that there's a consistency across that. So I, I appreciate that there, when you turn around things very, very rapidly, it does cause confusion. We have to make sure that there are channels open for those who are uncertain uh, in the time ahead to get answers quickly. Uh, and and the, the executive have been trying to ensure that we get proper information put in place and a quick turnaround response time. But the forum that has been set up specifically in relation to 
who should be in work and who shouldn't, but also what the conditions in work should be, uh, needs to get going very quickly and provide those type of answers to people. Okay, can I again ask members to kind of keep their contribution as minimal as they possibly can do? Rachel Woods. Very quickly, I have two points. Um, the £20 million of the COVID-19 funding not included in the budget outcome here. Uh, is there any indication of how this will be spent? And second of all, note in the statement of the domestic rate freezes and non-domestic rates issues, um, also note that pre previous civil contingencies grants and supports for council were through DFC, but what support measures are in place through this budget today for our local councils who are facing financial difficulties now? Uh, yes, can I say that the £20 million which wasn't spent, uh, when, when we set this budget or when I uh, made the statement on the 16th of March, at that stage we, we had an additional £120 million identified as part of the COVID response, of which we used £100 million. That additional £20 million will go into the subsequent money that we received, I think it was uh, £700-odd million that we received since that, and that will be added to that. Uh, part of that has been spread across a range of areas, uh, I think, we, of that. Uh, we have spent, in total, we received 912 million, uh, and so we, to date, we've spent 639, and that includes uh, the small business grant schemes, the, uh, the, the, the grants for those in the hospitality and tourism sector, the free school meals, the business rate break that we have announced, uh, the money for the Department of Health, which uh, involves uh, getting equipment, uh, community pharmacy, car park charges, testing kits. Uh, so there are a range of measures, and of that, 639 million percent. So there is still money available to that. We have asked departments to bid for support. Of course, what we, what, what the councils lose in terms of our rates approach, we will make up back to them. So the councils don't look, lose out uh, as a result of us reducing rates or giving a rates holiday. Uh, but we have asked departments to make a range of bids to us for specific projects. So if there are, I, I know the department communities uh, in terms of using the councils to uh, generate that which is already happening from the ground, that community support, that community activism uh, in terms of looking after neighbours and trying to do things for people that the Department of Communities are keen to generate money through the councils to support that, to guide it, to make sure it's doing the right thing, but also to provide some financial support to it. So uh, there will be a range of schemes which will be, I think, done through councils and working with councils to make sure uh, that money becomes available, not just for business support and that, but actually for the community response that is harnessed in a way which is productive uh, and which actually can uh, achieve a very significant outcome, and it's given a level of financial support to do that as well. I call Jim Allister. Okay, um, could I ask, is this the first time that we've entered a, a new financial year without an approved budget? Um, in regard to our present transformed circumstances, we obviously going forward have huge demands on health and on the economy. How far, therefore, has the Minister advised or instructed his executive colleagues to strip out non-priority resource spending? And in light of that, would he agree that it would be unconscionable in these circumstances to devote further millions of new spend to items like Ulster Scots and the Irish language, and should those projects, which were intended under New Decade, New Approach, now be parked for this year? And finally, I think he said to Mr. O'Toole that the Comptroller and Auditor General was relaxing their oversight. Is that what he said? And what are the ramifications of that? Minister. Can I say, in relation to the budget, it is approved. Uh, the executive approved the budget yesterday. Uh, no, the, 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 this budget comes to the assembly for a vote then on the estimates in May, uh, which you'll have a chance to then uh, vote uh, across the entirety of the, the budget proposition. But we are legally required to uh, have a budget through the executive and brought. To, in terms of a budget statement to the Assembly by the end of the financial year, which we have satisfied. Uh, in relation to flexibility in departments, we have, of course, departments right up to three weeks ago were working on the basis of what their pressures were and what they wanted to spend in this, this period ahead. Uh, and we had uh, the debate in relation to the, the previous budget debate, which we had a number of weeks ago, uh, which gave the allocation into the early months of the new financial year on the basis of what departments thought they would be spending at that time. And quite clearly, uh, I recognise the situation has changed. Uh, 
and, and we have asked departments to look very clearly at what they cannot spend that they intend to, some of which because this assembly will not be able to give the necessary approvals because it may not be functioning in a way which can legislate for some of those things, uh, and, and some areas where they had in terms of provision of services where those will no longer be possible over the next number of months to look again at relation that, and to, to uh, use that flexibility not to try and move it to other areas of pressures but actually to respond to the crisis that we're in. And so we will of course continue to work with the departments and to talk to the departments about how they're achieving that. I have to say I'm, I'm perhaps somewhat heartened that the only issue you'll ever find spending problems with is in relation to Ulster Scots and the Irish language and the entirety of the range of spending across the executive's budgets across all departments, that those are the ones that you focus in and that, that perhaps require uh, some, uh, some revisit. Uh, if that means the rest of them are okay, then that's not too bad. But can I say in relation to NDNA, we, we haven't got uh, the full a result of NDNA that we would want to do. We are still talking to the British Government in relation to all of that. Uh, and again, those projects and all projects fall into the same broad category in relation to the, uh, to the uh, if, if it is not possible to spend in the time ahead, then people need to look at what can be spent in terms of response to this crisis. Uh, and then if, if we are beyond that and it has not been possible for a variety of reasons, some of which may be because the, uh, the construction site isn't there to do jobs that we had wanted them to do in the, in, the, in the immediate period ahead, then people need to look again. And we will reallocate as the year goes on, and the executive will take collective decisions as the year goes on in relation to trying to spend our budget in the best and most effective way possible. Can I say in relation to the controller and order general, the, the particular issues we had were in relation to the 10K scheme and getting that out the door very quickly. Uh, and as part of the advice of the discussion between the Department of Finance and the Department of the Economy in relation to trying to get that scheme done quickly, we did consult them in relation to saying, you know, some of these things aren't as we would normally do, but we're facing into circumstances which are. Uh, and it's not to say that he would not scrutinise. Of course, he will scrutinise all departments. But what I was saying is that he had an understanding of the departments across here and uh, obviously departments in, in all governments are now trying to turn around things, get things out the door. Uh, on measures which they would normally take a very lengthy time to do consultation and uh, discussion on and testing and uh, involving uh, various sectors and, and analysing the costs attached to them, uh, that we, we, we have a, an urgency to be responsive to the crisis that we are facing. In, and he understands that. And it was just in that regard. It's not in, in relation to a general, uh, you know, do what you like approach, uh, but in specifically in relation to that scheme. I'm going to call Jerry Carl on just to say. Uh Mr. Carl, at the time, was more or less up. But just quickly, can the minister justify the people who are worried about their health uh, and uh, worried about putting food on the table to at this time, why there is not enough of an economic and spending shift at this time to face the pandemic? To me, it's unjustifiable. That we're not talking today about nationalisation, about requisition of private facilities, about uh, the mass production of PPE and bonuses for frontline staff. Just to name uh, a few of the issues that need to be addressed. Well, there were, there were a range of measures that were, uh, that were undertaken in the coronavirus bill, which I think uh, went through some approvals here last week. Uh, and I suppose if, if people wanted to amend those provisions, that was the time to do it. If you wanted to bring in additional powers to nationalise industries or to force manufacturers to make certain products at certain times, that was the place to do it, uh, and that, because that's where the powers. Some people have, have argued those powers are far too sweeping and far too draconian, and obviously we wanted to ensure that they were human rights compliant and that there was a, an end point to the adoption of those powers. Uh, so uh, I'm afraid that the budget can't uh, afford those measures, uh, but the coronavirus bill could have, and, and the members should have uh, attempted to amend it appropriately. Okay, members, that concludes questions on the statement. The next item on the business of business on the order paper is the first stage of a domestic abuse bill, and I call the Minister of Justice.